You don't have to read far in the Bible to know that faith is a very important thing. You find words like faith, belief, believe, trust. And this is a very important principle in our current series on biblical spirituality and discipleship. Did you notice that our hymns and scripture readings thus far are on faith, including this verse, Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But what does the Bible mean by faith and why is it so important? What do we mean when we say, I believe? Just what is faith? Well, let me get out my eraser and first erase off of the board some of the wrong ideas that people have. And they think that they have faith when they have something else that are mere substitutes for faith. First, faith is not wishful thinking. Kind of a blind optimism. I hope this happens, and I guess that's faith. No. Nor is faith believing in something that you know is not true. I heard that in an old movie years ago when the little child says, I believe and I believe. And it's kind of like I believe in Santa Claus. And the mother said, well, honey, faith is believing in something you know is not true. No, that's not faith. That's foolishness. The opposite of that is sometimes mistaken for faith, sort of a religious gullibility, credulity. Will you believe anything? Is sort of without looking into it. No, that's just a naiveness. That's not faith. Nor is faith what many people are teaching today, a positive mental attitude, which is optimistic and hopeful. Woman Vincent Peale wrote a book along that line called The Power of Positive Thinking, And his disciple, Robert Schuller, just changed it around a little bit and called it the power of possibility thinking. You can do it. That's not faith. Positive mental attitude. That's sort of just a blind optimism. A faith in faith is what some people would call it without any foundation. My mind goes back to an old song, and some of you are old enough to remember it. You remember that old song, I Believe? Frankie Lane hit the top ten and even Elvis recorded it. I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe for everyone that goes astray, someone will come to show the way. And on and on, on it went. That's blind optimism without biblical reality for foundation. That's not what we mean by faith. Nor do we mean what some churches mean in the faith movement. The word of faith. You maybe have seen them on television. They've written books. And what they mean is that you can have a faith that creates reality. And that that's what faith and prayer is all about. They are dead wrong. That's not what the Bible means. Nor is it, well, have faith in yourself. You've probably heard that in the last week during the Olympics. The coach will go over to a, a certain discouraged athlete and says, you can do it. You know, I watched the Olympics the other day, and they had a little excerpt of uh, 1996. You remember Carrie Strug, and she had hurt herself, and she was now at the, the time when she was going to do the vault and maybe win the gold medal. And she was very discouraged, and she was limping because she had injured herself. And her famous coach, Bella Carilli, said, Carrie, you can do it. You can do it. And she did it. And did you know after that, a lot of people said, well, that's an example of faith. This optimistic, you have it within yourself to do it. That is only optimism. And maybe there's a place for that in athletics when you see, yes, I've practiced, I've done it before, I can do it again. But that's not biblical faith. Let me quote you a Bible verse. 2 Corinthians 1.9 We should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So it's not faith in your ability. It's faith in God and his ability. Nor is it a leap of faith into the dark or blind faith or anything like that. Nor is faith presumption. Now, let me explain that. Faith is believing a promise that God has made. Unbelief is not believing a promise God has made. Presumption 
is believing a promise God has not made. And some people think that is faith. That's presumption. Now, let me explain that again. God has given us promises in some of the verses we read earlier. Notice in Hebrews 11, it talks about faith in the promise that God has made. God made a promise to Abraham. He kept it. Promise to Sarah. He kept it. They believed. Faith is believing a promise God has made. Unbelief, non-faith, is not believing a promise that God has clearly made or that a statement he has clearly made. Presumption is believing a promise God has not made. And we often slip into that and we think that's faith. And then when it doesn't come to pass, our faith is shattered. And then we begin to doubt God. That happens when a person says, I know I'm going to get better when I'm sick. God has promised me that. God has not promised us a life of perfect health. And so if we think, yes, I'm going to get better and we don't, we think God has failed us. God has not promised that. Or that person says, I've made this job application and God has given me a promise that I'm going to get that job. Where do you get that promise? Feelings, wishful thinking, the, pro- the basis for our belief in the promises of God are in this book. And we need to apply that to our life. But sometimes wishful thinking takes over and we even powder it up with religiosity. I remember many years ago, a young lady uh, was talking to us about a friend of hers. It was very obviously not a Christian. She was in jail. And uh, she said, well, I, I'm not only praying for her, I've stopped praying. God has told me she is going to be saved, and I believe that. And I'm thinking, Kirsten, God hasn't promised you that. We don't know if God's going to save Linda. We hope. We pray. But she says, no, no, no. I know it. I believe it. I don't think that woman was ever saved, not to my knowledge. But that's a blind presumption where we latch on to a promise God has not made. That's not faith. Faith is believing a promise that God has made. Now, I've just erased these wrong ideas of faith. Let's put in its place what the Bible does say faith is. Turn over to 1 John chapter 5, which we quoted a few times last week. Last week in our lesson, we looked at what's called assurance of faith. Now, in a way, that should have followed this morning's message, but be that as it may. We showed that part of faith is assent, agreement with what the Bible says. The Bible says certain things are true. You say, I agree with that. That's assent. You agree that a statement or a promise is true. To believe God is to believe that God is telling The truth. Now, a minute ago, I said faith is believing a promise, but it's also believing a statement that God says. God is not just simply giving questions or commands in the Bible. He gives statements of utter fact. He says, it is so, and faith is saying, it is so. I believe it. So to believe that that God is stating something that is true is part of faith. But look at 1 John 5, 10. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. We explored that last week. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. What is true faith? True faith is believing the testimony God has has given of his Son. He has given this statement, Jesus is the Son of God. He has died for our sins and risen from the dead. True faith agrees with that. And part of that is the promise that if we personally trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will will be saved. Together, that is faith. But look at the verse again. Non-faith or unbelief does not believe that statement or the promise. But that is not an innocent lack of faith. Look at the text again. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. Faith says what God says is true. Unbelief says, I don't believe what God says. I'm not convinced. I need evidence. The jury is still out. I will be the adjudicator of whether this is true or not. Not God. 
I don't believe it just because God says it or because the Bible says it. I want proof. I believe it because I am convinced it is true. And so a person that says, I'm not convinced, I don't yet believe, he is not simply in doubt. He is in unbelief. And what's, what is the heart of unbelief? Look at the text. He that does not believe God has made God a liar. Faith is saying God is saying the truth. Unbelief is saying God is not speaking the truth, which is another way of saying God is a liar. That's how serious this matter of faith and unbelief is. Oh, the arrogance of unbelief. The person that says, I'm neutral and objective, and I use the scientific method. I'm a seeker after truth. I read this Bible and I go to church. Well, I'm not sure if it's really true after all. Or the person that says, no, I just don't want to believe it. I don't believe it. I am not a Christian. I I don't believe in this Christianity. The arrogance of that. That's filled with pride. Oh, I'm a smart person. I've been to college. I know things. I'm street smart. No, that is arrogant unbelief that is calling God a liar. The arrogance. It insults God. Let me give you a human illustration. A number of years ago, I knew a young man. He was oh, about 30 at the time. And he had some physical ailment with his arm. And I said, well, how are you doing, buddy? And he said, well... I'm doing my own therapy. I said, well, have you been to the doctor? Oh, yeah, I've been to him several times. And he recommends the therapist, this, that, and the other. And I said, are you doing it? He says, no. And I said, why not? you got a good doctor. In fact, I know him. He's a Christian. And in fact, he's my doctor. And he said, well, you know, he did this and he did this. And he says, well, what does he know? He's just a doctor. I'm going to do what I want to. And I remember thinking, he's just a doctor. You barely got out of high school. He went to college For ten years, he did an internship. He did he did a residency. He's been board certified. He gets examined every year. And you're going to trust your own knowledge. You don't even know what's under your skin. He did tests, and you have the gall to say, "What does he know? He's just a doctor." You laugh at that. You'd say that's dumb, that's stupid. But that's just like the unbelief of the person that says, "What does God know? I'm going to go by my own ideas." The arrogance of unbelief. So faith includes agreement with what God says, saying, I believe it because God says it. Not because I have any other proof, but because God says it. That is part of faith, where you agree with it, you assent. You say, I believe it because God says it. But faith is that, and more than that. Last week, you remember I said faith includes assent. It's more than that, but it's not less than that. Now let's look at what I mean by saying faith is more than merely assenting. Because there are those that say, I agree that that it's true, but they don't go the extra step. You remember that verse over in uh, James 2, where a person says, well, I believe, I have faith, but he doesn't have works that show it. It shows that he doesn't have true faith. And then James really gets down to brass text and says, oh, you say you have faith? The demons also have that kind of a faith. They know that this is true. There are no atheists in hell. The demons know that the Bible is true, but they don't have true faith. Why? Though they know it is true, they don't go to the extra step and have saving faith. What's this this extra step? Trust. Where you entrust yourself on the basis of this knowledge that God is true. The devils don't do that, and there are many people in the world today that are not like that don't also have trust, even though they may have assent. They may repeat the Apostles' Creed. They may agree with the five points of Calvinism or the four spiritual laws. But if they do not have trust, they do not have true faith. Now at this juncture, let me retell an old illustration. You've probably heard it, and it's true. It's about that famous man from France that was a high wire aerialist and he could walk back and forth and do all sorts of tricks. So they strung a high wire across Niagara Falls from Buffalo, New York, all the way over to Canada. And thousands of people paid their money to watch him and he walked across it. And oh, they cheered and they cheered and he did it again and he did it blindfolded. And then he did it carrying someone on his back and he did all sorts of things. Then he took a wheelbarrow and filled it with about a hundred pounds of rocks and dirt and he wheeled the wheelbarrow across and back. The crowd was going wild. 
So he comes over to the crowd and he says, do you believe that I could empty the wheelbarrow and put a person in there and wheel him across? And they said, yes, we believe you can do that. And he turned to a man and says, do you believe I can do it? And the man says, yes, I believe you can do it. And he says, okay, buddy, hop in. And the man ran away like a scared jackrabbit. He agreed in his mind that he could do it, but he didn't trust his life to the man. Now, you get the illustration. Churches are filled with people that will say, I believe up here, but they don't trust down here in their hearts. And that's what we're going to concentrate on this morning. Faith as trust. If you reach in your pocket, you'll probably find a coin that says, in God we trust. Part of our national motto. I wonder how many of us really believe that. For many people, it should be in gold we trust. But in God we trust. By the way, that's loosely based based upon a verse in the Bible. Do we really trust God? We say it. Do we mean it? In the trials of life, do we show, yes, I am trusting God? Now, we're looking at faith this morning. When you look in the New Testament, you usually find words like faith, believe, belief. In the Old Testament, you usually find it translated as trust. Remember, I mentioned earlier, amen is that Hebrew word meaning I believe, and it's often translated as trust. So I got out my concordance a few days ago, and I looked it up, and I found something like 162 times where the word trust or trusted is found. A lot more than belief or faith. But it's the same basic idea. And most of them, or at least a large number of them, were in the book of Psalms. So let's look at one of those. Turn with me to Psalm 36. David wrote most of the Psalms. And David was a man of faith because he trusted God. And when you look up the verses where the word trust is found, you find that David was in great need. Emergencies, running for his life, very sick, feeling very guilty, whatever. Great need. And in one of them, he said this, Psalm 56, 3, he said, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. You say, David, he killed Goliath. Oh, he was a man of faith that knew no fear. Of course not. He had faith. But you still go through a valley of fear. We do all, all, over all sorts of things. We fear the future. We fear some danger that may or may not be there. We don't know the future. We look into the the future and we see sometimes it's covered in fog. And we say, I don't know what the future holds. And that creates fear in us. So we looked around us and we see danger. David saw that. We go through fear. We should do like David and say, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. All sorts of things cause us to be afraid. Ladies, let me tell you one of the deep fears that men have. Especially men that are married and that are fathers. I've had many men say to me, Kurt, my deepest fear is that something's going to happen to me and I won't be able to provide for my family. I'll be incapacitated. I'll be handicapped. I'll be blinded or I'll even die. And Who's going to take care of my wife and my children? I've had men tremble saying, that is my deepest fear. They're counting on me. What if I lose my job? And then other things that cause us to fear. The Bible says our deepest fear is the fear of death. Look it up, Hebrews 2. David said, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. And that's one of the tests of our faith. When we are afraid, when we have a panic attack, we should lack hold of God and say, God, I don't understand. I am afraid, but I'm going to trust in you. Now, I looked up in the Psalms and found out that there were several places where David also said, I will trust in you and find comfort, reassurance, or refuge. And I found six of them where he said, I or they will trust under your wings. Look at Psalm 36, verse 7. How precious is your love and kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. You find that metaphor used at least six times in the Psalms. 
Jesus referred to it. He's saying, how precious is your love and kindness. And he's talking about the righteousness earlier, the faithfulness of God, earlier, the mercy of God, the promises of God. But he uses this very unusual metaphor. He says, I and the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. What's he saying? It's a very picturesque metaphor he uses. Some of you were raised on farms and you know what this is talking about. Kind of, you're shaking your head. You've seen that, you little farm girl over here. It's the idea that there's this mother hen out there with all her little chicks out there pecking away at the seeds, trying to find something. And then a storm comes up. Or maybe they hear a chicken hawk off in the distance, or, or they hear uh, some danger from a wolf or something out there. Those little chicks, because of their instinct, they get very afraid. So what do they do? Instinctively, they run over to their mother. But first, what the mother does is... She'll cluck in a certain way and maybe flap her wings in a certain way. All those little chicks come running. She lifts up the wings and the little chicks come underneath there. And that mother hen covers them with her wings. Those little chicks are now trusting in their mother's care. They feel safe and secure because they know that mother hen would rather die than let anything happen to those little chicks. Woe be to any chicken hawk that comes into that barnyard and faces an angry mother hen. Some of you have seen that. That's the analogy David is using. In times of danger or fear, he says, I run to the Lord. And he says, this is what the children of men do. They put their trust under the shadow of his wings. Dear brethren, there are times that we're afraid, we're in danger. Medical reports don't look good. We get disappointed in life and the tears come and we feel as helpless as a little chick in the barnyard. We need to put our trust in God and find safety and security under his wings because he is like that mother hen that loves us and will protect us. And we don't understand it all. There's something else. I remember an old wise man pointed this out to me many years ago. I think he lived on a farm. He says, there's something else. When those little chicks are under the, the mother hen's wings, they can hear the beating of the mother hen's heart. Just like a little baby when it's in the womb, later grows up and is hurting and crying, and goes up to mama and mama holds it up here. That little child can instinctively sense the beating of the mother's heart. In other words, the expression of love. When we draw near to God at those times and we trust in him, we sense his love. Look at the verse again. How precious is your love and kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust. That's faith. When we trust in God in time of need. Psalm 62, 8. David said, trust in him at all times. How? Because we trust that God keeps his promises. He really does care for us. And when we're in a valley of difficulty or when it seems everything is hopeless, that's when we need to run to God and say, I'm going to trust in God. God always keeps his promises because it's as if God says, trust me, I care. And dear brethren, he really does care for you. And he says so. Psalm 119.42, David says, I trust in your word. You remember, it's not faith in faith. It's trust in his word. God has given us a book of his promises. And when we study them, we can trust in them by trusting in him. The Bible, its statements and its promises. But sometimes we don't understand it. Book of Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. There will be times we don't understand things. But when the head cannot understand, the heart can still trust. And dear brethren, that's the real trial of faith. You see, there are things in the Bible we can understand. We can look back in our life and say, yes, God has done this before. True faith always comes to this point where you come to that point and you say, I don't understand. But I still trust God. You might be able to study it in Greek and Hebrew. You might be able to read theology. There always comes that point in our life when you say, I don't understand. 
but I still believe God. I am still going to trust in him no matter what. And it's usually at that point the tears are coming and our heart is breaking and we cry out, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand why I'm going through this. Yes, you said things are going to work out for my good. I don't see how this is going to work out for my good. But I still believe in you anyway, O oh Lord. That's true faith. Not the person says, oh, I've got it all, all charted out. You don't know the future. And it's not just a cheap cliche that says, I don't know what the future holds, but I know that holds the future. That is, there's a lot of truth in that. When you say, I don't understand, but I still trust God anyway. That's the heart of faith when you believe him from the heart. You see, brethren, trust holds on to God. It's like God comes out of the dark and says, trust me, I see the future. You don't. Trust me, grab hold of the hand of God, the promises of God. God does not desert his children. He'll always take you to that, to that point where you don't understand, you're hurting. And you've come to the very edge of your understanding. He says, grab hold of my hand. And brethren, it's not trust in your hand. It's in his hand. You say, my hand is very weak, but his hand is very strong. Grab hold of him in your weaknesses because he gives you the solid promise. He will see you through it. Trust puts yourself in God's hands. Weak as we may be, God is strong. And trust is a commitment to God when we feel weak and we, when we sense danger. For example, when we are facing surgery. There are those in this auditorium that know just what I'm saying. You have been in a sick bed. And it's very life-threatening. And the doctor says the tests say it's cancer, leukemia, or something. Or we, need, we need to have surgery now, tomorrow. It's very important to save your life. And you don't understand it and your emotions are welling up and you're afraid. What if it doesn't work out right? What if I'm handicapped? What if I die? There are those in this auditorium that can testify what that moment means. You breathe deeply. And you look up at the doctor and say, Doc, I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm going to trust you. Have you ever come to that point where you say to the doctor, Doctor, my life is in your hands. Let's do it. And he says, okay. And he gives you the anesthesia. And if you're here, you woke up. So you survived it. But that point where you say, Doc, I'm trusting in you. It's not like he's going to ask your opinion as he's operating on you. You're going to be under. You're putting your life in his hands. That's trust and even more so, brethren, we trust in God day by day when we don't understand, but we say, Lord, I am trusting in you. I am putting my life in your hands. And there's something else. We find a man like that in the Old Testament. His name was Job. And look at all that he went through. You know about the heartache. He lost his family except for his wife who went through this debilitating, painful disease. And on top of that, his so-called friends come and they jump all over him and they blame him. Poor old Joe. But he still trusted in God. And he didn't expect to survive it in this life. Read the book over and over again. He actually expected he was going to die of that of affliction. If there were doctors nearby, they would have said it's hopeless. This is incurable. And here's the great golden verse in the book of Job. Job 13, 15. He says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's faith. He's saying God's going to kill me. I don't know how he's going to get out of me. He hasn't given me a promise if he's going to see me through this. But I know that my Redeemer lives and I know I'm going to see him on the other side. So he says, I don't expect to live through this. But even if God kills me, I'm still going to trust him. That's trust. That's trust that gives your whole life to him. That's true faith. You see, brethren, God says, trust me. Faith says God is trustworthy. He is worthy of my faith, my life, my all. I'm not holding back. I'm giving him my everything. Now, let me teach you a little bit more about faith. The verb is we believe. 
And when you study the Bible, you find that that word believe is often attached to other words. And we call these words prepositions. For example, over in 1 Thessalonians, it says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. This is the idea of faith and assent. We believe that this is true. The gospel says he died, he rose. We believe that it is true. But then it also says we are to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes it a little bit more personal. It's now going from the head slowly into the heart. The Bible says we are to believe in Jesus. Sometimes they even believe into him. But let me show you another one you may have missed. Turn over to Acts 16. This is a verse I've often preached on. We even have it on the little sign close to the entrance of our church. Acts 16.31. And I want to call your attention to a preposition. And maybe a Bible translation you have mistranslates it. Look at 16.31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be safe. Some have it believe in. I looked it up in the Greek. It's very explicit. It's not believe in. It's not believe into. It's not believe that. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you find it one or two other times in the book of Acts. What does this mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? It's similar to believe in, but it's more emphatic. What it means is I believe and I trust on Christ. I rely on him. I depend upon him. I trust in him. And that is saving faith. And notice what it's based upon. Paul has already preached the gospel to them. So he says, you accept this in your mind and in your heart. You trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. You rely on him. So we believe that. We believe in. We believe in too. We believe on. But also there's a couple of places it doesn't even have a preposition. And that's where it's most personal of all. Once there was a time a woman was talking to the Lord Jesus Christ and the tears were flowing. Her heart was breaking and Jesus gives her a great promise. And he said to her, woman, believe me. He didn't say believe me, believe on me. He just said believe me. That was so intimate there wasn't even a room for a preposition. That's the most personal aspect of trust and faith. And brethren, that's what God calls upon us to do. Not just to believe in our minds, but to believe in our heart personally in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happens when we first believe and are saved. As it says here, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You believe personally in him. Now, someone might say, now, I, I, please clarify this before you go any further, preacher. Are you saying we believe in God or in Jesus? And the answer is yes. It's both. John 14, 1, Jesus said, Believe in God, believe also in me. How do we believe in God? Believing in God is not just, well, I, I'm a Christian, I have religion, I believe that God is up there. Yes, that's the first step. Hebrews eleven six. he that cometh to God must believe that he is. But that's not enough. The demons believe that God is. We have to believe in God, in his existence, but we believe personally in God by believing personally in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is God in the flesh come down to present himself to us as the foundation of personal faith. We believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and we believe Christ himself personally. Have you believed in Jesus Christ in this way? Where you believe the gospel, you know it's truth, true, and you believe on him and you believe in him. You believe him and you trust him with your all. Now, this is what we call saving faith. We are saved by faith alone. This kind of faith where we trust in him implicitly, explicitly, without reservation, where we commit ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's saving faith. Ah, but there is a non-saving faith. You say, what is non-saving faith? Well, it'd be like what those demons have, where they assent, but they don't trust. Or like those in the Gospels. You remember, there were people that had enough faith to believe Jesus could heal them, but they didn't trust their lives to him. So they went away healed, but they went away lost. 
And there are people like that that will say, I'll trust him to heal me. I'll trust him with my bank book. I'll trust him with my family. But they don't trust him with their heart, with their life. God wants everything. And that will be true saving faith. Now, that is the duty that God lays upon us. And, of course, it's a gift that God gives us. This wonderful method of faith is amazing. The Bible tells us all about this and even tells us that though God commands us to believe, God gives what he commands. Faith is a gift from God. Now, we are saved by faith, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it doesn't end there. We are saved by faith and we follow him by faith. We could have sung that song earlier today. Trust and obey for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. And the Bible has a very lovely word for this ongoing nature of faith. It is faithfulness. Galatians 5.22 calls it one of the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit gives us saving faith. He gives it to us. We're born again. We're justified. But He continues to supply us with ongoing faith. What does that mean? We trust Him and we continue to trust Him. Trust and obey. This is the faith that keeps on believing and keeps on trusting. And sometimes it walks. Sometimes it runs. But brethren, some of us know sometimes it just crawls. But it's still making progress. We walk by faith. We run by faith. We crawl by faith. But that's faithfulness. It's loyalty. It's continued dependence upon God no matter what. It's that kind of trust that says, I don't care what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm still going to trust God. And God says, keep following me. And we keep on following him. We're faithful and we're loyal. It's been my privilege to know a few men and women that have been Marines. And you know what the Marine Corps motto is? Semper Fi. Do you ever see the bumper sticker? And you say, what does that mean, Semper Fi? It's short for a Latin phrase, Semper Fidelis. And you know what that means? Always faithful. And that should be the motto of Christians, too. Always faithful. I'm going to keep on trusting God no matter what happens. Even if I have to crawl through life with a broken heart, with tears coming down. True faith says... I will still trust God. I don't understand it all. But I know God is faithful. I will still trust Him no matter what. Always faithful. But it's easy to say it. You know, we've sung two hymns this morning on faith. It seems easy on Sunday morning. Just wait till Monday morning. Tuesday afternoon. Thursday night. And a new emergency comes. None of us here knows what this next week will hold. We could be with James Black in the hospital. Someone in your family could be phoning me up to perform your funeral. We don't know what the next week holds. And that's why we say, Lord, I trust you for the days and months and years ahead. I don't know. God could put any one of us into the trial of faith. James 1, 1 Peter 1 talks about this crucible of of a fiery faith where it's like the fire is testing the gold and the impurities rise. God throws us into that day by day and sometimes into a very great trial of faith. And some of you know what that's like. Some of you may be in one right now. Well, you say, it's never been so hot in my life before. My faith has never been tested like it is now. That proves whether you really do trust God. How much do you? It purifies. And did you know it even increases your faith? How? Because it takes away from you everything else you're trusting in. And all you've got left is God. And when you have only God and you hold on to Him, it's like you're holding on for dear life. That will be the test of your faith and of your trust. And God will hold on and He will prove it and He will prove His faithfulness to you at that time. And later on you'll look back and say, praise the Lord. He kept His promises. And Lord, thank You for giving me the faith to hold on. That's the trial of faith. And then one day, God will see us through this life of testing and trials and tears. And the time will come when He'll take us out of this life. And the reward for faith will be sight. Now we walk by faith, not by sight, 
But the moment we leave this life, we walk into heaven with eyes open and we see God. The God we've been trusting all along. And he'll say, welcome home. And the walk of faith will be finished in eternity. Keep trusting God, brethren. God is trustworthy. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, confirm your promises in your word. And by your spirit, increase our faith. Your word feeds us faith. Take away from us everything else that we trust in so that we simply trust in you and find that you are indeed totally trustworthy. We thank you. We praise you. And we trust you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.